The sermon text today is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 8. Acts, chapter 8. I'll be reading verses 1 to 25. These are the words of God. And Saul was consenting unto his death, speaking of Stephen. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. And there was great joy in that city. And there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip, and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done." Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. And Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Let's pray together. Our Father, help us to understand this portion of your word this morning that your spirit has inspired for us. Open our eyes, open our hearts, that we might know you and trust you even more, and know what we should do. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're continuing to work our way through the book of Acts together, week by week, take chunks of the book of Acts and work our way through it. Here we see in chapter 8 of Acts the continuing conquest of Christ. And we, we said, we've said this a number of times as we've been working our way through the beginning of Acts, uh, but I don't want you to forget this. In, in many respects, Luke wants you to think of the book of Acts as the continuing work of Christ. Uh, he says at the beginning of, of uh, Acts that uh, his first volume was all about what Jesus began to do and teach. And the implication is, is now this is what Jesus continues to do and teach now through the person of his Holy Spirit, working in the church. So this is Jesus still working. And, and, that, and that really applies all the way down to the present. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit of the risen Jesus, the risen Christ. And where he is, Christ is at work. So here we have the continuing conquest of Christ, and we see it going forth out of Jerusalem, now to the Samaritans. I... Uh, had no idea, actually, that we were going to read the, the New Testament lesson that was coming from John this morning. I should have checked. Uh, it's Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman. This is, this, you know, this is how we know Jesus is with us. <laughs> He's like, here, <laughs> you need to read about that. Uh, the Samaritans. This is, this is the gospel of Jesus going to the Samaritans. It's breaking out of Jerusalem, 
and it's going north into Samaria, to the city of, of, of Samaria in particular, into the land of the Samaritans. And, and it's colliding then with centuries of unbelief and idolatry. Uh, the reason why, you, you may remember it, 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 earlier in the conversation, the Samaritan woman says, why are you talking to me? Usually Jews don't talk to Samaritans. Usually Jews are not friendly with Samaritans. Be, you know, and she even cites it in the conversation that you just heard with Jesus. Uh, that we, have, we have pretty different views about how God is to be worshipped and where God is to be worshipped. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. But Christ is extending his kingdom now conquering the Samaritans, conquering centuries of idolatry and syncretism, mixing idol worship with the worship of the true God. And what we see here is the Holy Spirit of Christ getting the victory and the word going forth with power. That's, that's what the story is about. This is the continuing conquest of Christ over centuries of idolatry and syncretism. And so the message for us this morning is to believe that this is the Christ that you serve. This is the message. This is the message. Watch Christ conquer. Now, where is the region? Where is the region you say, oh, no, the gospel could never take that. (laughs) No. I mean, we pray for North Korea, but really? Or, yeah, we pray for my, my dad. We pray for my mom. We pray for my brother. We pray for my sister. We pray for my son, we pray for my daughter, but I just don't see it, right? That's the message, right? Jesus says to you, no, watch. Watch this. The message for us is to trust him, trust the power of his word, the power of the gospel, and not lose heart. That's the message, okay? Particularly for those who seem so far off, so far gone. So let's walk through this text uh, briefly, and then push some of these things into the corners. So the chapter begins picking up right after uh, the, the murder of Stephen, the first martyr of the church. Uh, they've, they've murdered him, they've stoned him to death. And remember, Saul was the one consenting to the death. Saul of Tarsus, Saul who became Paul the evangelist. He was the one standing there that they laid their clothes at his, his, his feet. He was the one approving it, overseeing it. And um, it picks the, up there in verse 1. Saul's the one uh, who was consenting to that death, and he begins a great persecution. He begins a great persecution of the church at Jerusalem. Saul thought he was in the driver's seat. Saul thought he was in charge uh, and persecuting the church, throwing people in prison, and he was wreaking havoc. He was doing harm. He was doing evil, but he's actually doing what is needed to be done in order to accomplish exactly what Jesus planned to do, right? Remember, uh, Jesus said in chapter 1, before he ascended to the Father's right hand, you will be witnesses of me here in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is the battle plan. Jesus has said that. First, we're going to take Jerusalem, then Judea and Samaria, and then the ends of the earth. Got it? That's the plan. Go. Right? That's the mission. And Saul is herding up a few people, throwing him in jail, scattering the Christians. And what are they doing? First of all, just as as they're scattered, verse 4, everywhere they go preaching the word. Oops. (laughs) Right? They're they're disrupted, and the gospel's going forth. He thinks he's in charge, and Jesus says, right on schedule. Right? The plan was to get the word out of Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria. This will do. Right? This is how God has done it from jump. He takes the evil intentions of men, and he turns them to good. Uh, Joseph, you know, famous story of this in in Egypt. His brothers sell him. He's mistreated in all kinds of ways. And what he tells the brothers there at the end is what you intended for evil, God intended for good. What evil men intend for evil, God overrules. Uh, What what evil men intend for evil, uh, God overrules for good. So uh, Saul thinks he's in the driver's seat persecuting the church. But remember, Jesus had foretold that the testimony of the apostles would go forth from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And so here, the Christians are scattered, exactly where Jesus said they would be scattered, to Judea and Samaria. uh, And they're preaching the word everywhere they go. That's verses 1 to 4. One particular instance of this scattering is another deacon. 
Remember, Philip doesn't just, you say, Philip, where'd he come from? Well, he was one of the deacons that was appointed, uh, and just like Stephen was. So this is picking up with another one of the first deacons. And he preached and healed in a city of Samaria. This is verses 5 to 8. Notice uh, there in verse 8, as he's preaching and healing and the gospel's going forth, Luke says, and there was great joy in that city. This is why we want the gospel to go forth. We want people to be happy. Right? Don't, don't forget that. Right? Why do we want to plant a church in Troy? Because we want Troy to be happy. We want Troy to have the joy of the Lord. Why do we want to fill Moscow with Christian churches? Because we want Moscow to be full of joy. This is what happens when the gospel goes forth. When your sins are forgiven, when you're reconciled to the Father, when you're reconciled to your wife, when you're reconciled to your husband, when you're reconciled to your children and your parents, and you begin telling the truth in your business and in your neighborhood, and you begin honoring what, what happens. It's fullness of joy. Right? Samaria suddenly has joy because the gospel's taken root there. That's verses 5 to 8. Among the converts, we're told, was a magician, a sorcerer, named Simon who had formerly had great influence over the people. And he believed in Christ, and he was baptized, it says, verses 9 to 13. Then, hearing about the success of the gospel, there's a number of new converts and new believers uh, in Samaria. Peter and John are sent by the apostles to come and establish the church there. Come establish the church there. And when the Spirit was given to the new Christians, Simon offered money to the apostles for that power. That's verses 14 to 19. Peter, of course, responds by condemning Simon, calling him to repentance, particularly for his poisonous bitterness and a conspiracy or a tangle of evil. Then when Simon asks for prayer, please pray for me, the word continues to spread. That's verses 20 to 25. Notice even in the midst of this, you know, a prominent citizen is converted. We've noted, we've noted this a number of times in the book of Acts. One of the key themes of the book of Acts is at the moments where you're tempted to think, oh no, the Holy Spirit says, right on schedule. Where you're tempted to say, oh, oh no, this is that, oh great, this is it. All right? Peter and John are thrown into prison, oh no. <laughs> Jesus says, watch this. At the point at which you're saying, oh, oh no, now, oh look, there's a controversy. A leading citizen has converted, and now he's got an argument with the apostles, oh no. And, you know, and, and the apostles weren't, you know, they, Peter just levels it at him. You better repent now, you're in huge trouble. And, oh no. You know, showdown between, you know, you know, was he a mayor, was he a high priest, we don't know. But, you know, he's a prominent citizen. Peter doesn't take anything from him, condemns him. Now, you know, what does the newspaper headline say, Right? Uh, you know, the, you know new, new sect disrespects centuries-old religion, right? <laughs> oh, no. But what does it say? What does Luke say? Well, just when you think there's this collision, oh, no, there's a controversy. There's a big controversy. There's a bunch of headlines. It says, and they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Right? What you think might be not good for the gospel, the Holy Spirit says, oh, watch this. Watch this. Everybody's going to say, oh, no, what are they going to say next? <laughs> and Peter and John say, hey, Jesus was crucified, buried, rose again for your salvation. That's how the gospel goes forth. Now, before I get to um, Simon and, and, and that and, and drilling down into, into, into that whole episode, I just want to note at the beginning of this uh, text that there's this fierce persecution that breaks out, and Luke um, records that devout men carried Stephen's body to burial, and, and they mourned his death. That's verses 1 uh, and 2. It's just it's striking that he, he mentions that. There's this persecution breaking out. People are getting thrown into jail, so it's, it's pretty significant persecution. And in the midst of that turmoil, in the, in the midst of that chaos, in the midst of that unsettling um, a historic event, it says that devout men carried Stephen's body to burial and they had a great lamentation. They mourned his death, one and two. This demonstrates that funerals and memorials are thoroughly Christian acts. These, these are not um, things that you can do or not do. They're, they're not, you know, here or there. Uh, a Christian funeral, a Christian memorial service is a thoroughly Christian thing. It's a thoroughly Christian thing. 
And, and, um, it, and particularly, it has to do with our belief in the resurrection of the body. Right? This, is one of the, this is why it matters that they buried Stephen's body. You could imagine some Christians maybe thinking they're being super spiritual, like, he's dead, his spirit's in heaven, who cares what happens to his body? Right? We gotta go, we're being persecuted. We, we know, we need to, whatever. We're, Philip's got a new ministry in Samaria, let's just leave his body, who cares? Let, you know, we gotta get people saved. There, you know, there might be certain ways in which Christians might think that, and, and Luke stops and says, no, in the midst of the persecution, in the midst of the gospel going forth, devout men made a point to honor Stephen's body, give it a burial, Christian burial, and they mourned him. This is a thoroughly Christian thing. Why? Well, because Christians are those who have been joined to Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection. Now, that's what it means to be a Christian, fundamentally. You've been joined to Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the resurrection. Uh, there is a sense in which it is right to say that Christians can never die. Our bodies stop, you know, stop living, but Jesus said that if you believe in him, who is the resurrection and the life, you can never die. You will never die. There's a sense in which we never die. And that's why often, uh, at least a number of times in the New Testament, dying, Christians dying in the Lord, is sometimes described as falling asleep. You might have noticed that sometimes as you're reading through the New Testament. It says he fall, fell asleep. You say, what? <laughs> um, and in fact, that's what it says in the previous verse. In, in chapter 7, verse 60, when it's talking about Stephen, it says, and he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Right? It says that about Stephen. Um, it, it says this, uh, Jesus is talking about Lazarus who's died, and he says he's asleep. And, the, and you know, the, the disciples have this thing where like, well, if he's sleeping, it'll be fine, Lord. And Jesus says, no, he's dead. What I mean by sleep, he's, he's dead. Oh, that's a little different. Right? Um, but this is a description that's used of Christians who die because... There's something temporary about what's happened to the body. Like sleep, you wake up from sleep. The promise of the gospel is resurrection, just like Jesus. The promise of the gospel is resurrection in our bodies, just like Jesus. In 2 Corinthians, it says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 8. And so we believe that when someone dies, their soul, their spirit goes to be with the Lord right away. Immediately. To be, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But that doesn't mean then that the body is worthless or meaningless. Just because the spirit's left doesn't mean that the body is meaningless. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says that our physical bodies go down into the ground like a seed. 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 38. Our physical bodies go into the ground like seed, and that's why we describe it as sleeping. Uh, it's it's asleep. It looks asleep in that sense, but it's also temporary. We believe that God will raise our bodies from the dead. So this is why, historically, Christians have buried their dead instead of burning the dead. Right? Um, this is why Christians have historically buried the dead, not burned the dead. Uh, it's, a, it's historically far more of a pagan practice. Now, of course, I know we live in an age in which cremation is becoming more and more common. It, it, probably everybody in the room has some relative who you said, eh, eh, I wish they wouldn't do that. Um, and maybe you even had an opportunity to try to tell them they shouldn't. Um, so we're, we're, we should, what we should want is, um, culturally, we want to return to the normalcy of burying the dead. Um, you have to pick your battles, and sometimes, you know, it's one of those things where you, it's not worth breaking up a family over. It's not that kind of thing. And God is able to put back together all the pieces, <laughs> Right, where some people are, are die at sea, some people, you know, even when you go into the ground, you're going to turn into dust, and you know, maybe someone, you know, three thousand years from now is going to bulldoze your grave, and there you go. <laughs> oh, what? right. Well, God's still going to put all that back together. God's going to put it together and give us glorified, immortal bodies. And so it's not a it's not a matter of limiting God. It's a matter of our testimony. And so what we would want to do is long term, we want to be building a culture that buries the dead because we want to honor those bodies and say, why, and they say, why do you go through the trouble of doing that? Because we believe in the resurrection. We, because we believe that this is a seed going into the ground, and one day God's going to raise it from the dead, just like he raised Jesus from the dead. So that's what we're trying to uh, uh, preserve and recover for a long time. That was Christian practice, and it's, it's fading in the West as paganism invades, and we want to seek to preserve it and recover it 
as a testimony of our hope in the resurrection. Likewise, just note that it is also not only devout to bury the dead, it is also devout to mourn the dead. It's, it's not unchristian to mourn. It's Christian to lament. It's Christian to mourn. We, these are people that we love dearly. These are people who blessed us dearly. It is Christian to mourn the dead. The devout men mourned the dead. But always remember that we do not mourn as those without hope. 1 Thessalonians 4.13, right? Mourn, but do not mourn like those who have no hope. Mourn as those who believe in the resurrection. Mourn as those who, like you're at an airport and you're saying goodbye, but you fully expect, it's going to be a while, but you fully expect to see them again. Mourn like that. It hurts. It stings. Eh, but you believe. Believe in the resurrection. Don't mourn as those without hope. Now, I've already noted uh, that, this, that uh, here in this text, the, as the persecution goes forth, the gospel's going forth to the Samaritans. I, and, I, and I briefly already noted that the Samaritans are basically a Jewish cult that originated at the time of the exile. So just a quick review. Um, if you have time later on, I encourage you to read 2 Kings 17. 2 Kings 17, that's a text that I put in your notes. But that's where uh, the exile of the northern kingdom happens, and that's where the Samaritans are introduced. So in the Bible, it's not just in the Gospels. They actually are introduced in 2 Kings 17, um, you know, about uh, 600, uh, 700 years before Jesus, um, when the northern kingdom uh, was conquered uh, by the Assyrians. So remember, before that, Samaria was the capital city of Ahab's northern kingdom. Ahab, bad guy, remember? Ahab married Jezebel, introduced Baal worship into the northern kingdom. He made Samaria his capital. So Samaria was the capital of Ahab's Baal worshiping regime. Remember, persecuting the prophets, killing many of the prophets, uh, had the showdown with Elijah on uh, Mount Carmel and so forth. Then, uh, uh, centuries later, when the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered by Assyria, they established syncretistic practices of worship of the true God alongside other false gods. Again, you can see that in 2 Kings 17, and it describes that. It says that, they, that the Assyrians intentionally set up a syncretistic worship. They tried to worship the living God and false gods together. That's what syncretistic means. They mixed it together. And so that's what it says in 2 Kings 17. They mixed the pagan worship practices and the worship of the true God together. So this explains why when Israel is returning to the land, they don't get along with the Samaritans. The Samaritans are basically kind of like Muslims, kind of like Mormons, kind of like Jehovah's Witnesses. Right? They've tried to mix together, blend together, biblical uh, faith, biblical religion, and false religion. That's what they've tried to do, which, of course, you can't do can't actually do, um, but that's what they were. They were basically a Jewish cult. Think Islam, think Jehovah's Witnesses, think Mormons, uh, but they had been going at it for centuries, right? So in keeping with this, Simon is introduced as one of the leaders of their cult. Right? So he's one of the leaders of their cult. He's got um, uh, some kind of influence, some kind of power, maybe some actual demonic power that's actually doing some uh, real wonders and maybe also some um, sleight of hand and trickery. Uh, either way, that's who Simon is. And, and so first of all, this really should underline the power of the gospel to penetrate even those communities and hearts that may seem to us most darker enslaved. Right? Well, who are the Samaritans of our day? The Muslims and the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Roman Catholics. I mean, where, where you have various forms of syncretism, and, and you say, um, can the gospel conquer them? Will the, will the gospel win the Middle East? Will the gospel win, and, and, and will all of the Mormons repent? Right? Will, will they? Will they? Well, here's, a, here's, a, here's a, a text for us right here at the beginning as the Holy Spirit's poured out and this gospel goes forth. 700 years of a cult. And the gospel goes forth with power and many believe and many are saved. Right. That's the answer. Can the gospel conquer these cults? Yes. Right. And it's, and if, remember the marching orders. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. Right. These are, these are, conquest orders. This is not try to get a few of them. It's 
right? Do what? Preach the gospel, disciple the nations, disciple them, right? Teach them everything, all of them everything, and baptize them all. That's the mission, that's the plan, right? That's the mission, that's the plan. Jesus is Lord, and he's going to do it. And so the first thing that we should just see this is watch the gospel colliding with 700 years of a cult, right? America's not even 700 years old. Like, we're, we're, like, yeah. Again, think of something like Islam, right? Think of something that's so deeply rooted for centuries and centuries, right? And Jesus says, Muslims belong to me. They belong to me. Christ died, right? Christ died to conquer the, the, the Muslim nations, right? So first of all, this underlines the power of the gospel to penetrate and conquer even those communities and hearts that seem to us most dark or enslaved, right? So again, think of modern cults. Think of Islam. But think of maybe the most recent things. You, you, know, you, you look at, you know, whatever. You're watching the news and you say, look, you know, look at the LGBT jihad, right? Look, look at the, look at that, um, look at them coming. Look at them coming, right? They're not even hiding anymore. We're coming for your children, they're telling us, right? right? And, and, and they seem to be getting so much momentum, so much ground, right? And, and but we ought, we ought not to lose hope. We ought not to lose heart. We ought to say, oh, this is, the, this is what the gospel's for. This is what the gospel is for, right? And notice it. Notice what, when is this happening? It's happening as persecution is building steam, right? Persecution's building steam, right? Saul's throwing people in jail. We had a few people in jail for 15 minutes. Uh, you know, I mean, like, but it's like not even, you know, not even quite close to that yet. And yet, what is, what is Christ doing? Sending the gospel forth, converting the nations. We ought to be thinking this is our moment. This is our moment. Christ died, rose again, ascended to the right hand of the Father for this moment. And of course, this should even apply to your family. Maybe there's people in your family who say it's just a, it's a brick wall. It's an iron curtain. <laughs> right? it, it's, it feels like centuries of darkness. I, can't, you know, I bring the gospel and it's just like bouncing a ping pong ball off their forehead. Right? It, nothing. Nothing registers, or they hate it, they're antagonists, don't talk to me about Jesus, don't talk to me about your religion, whatever. And you think, how, how can the gospel get in there? How can the gospel get in there? Well, how could the gospel get in here? Right? Right? Christ is king, that's how. Christ is king, Christ is Lord, that's how. And so, do not lose heart. This story also underlines, I think, one of the hardest areas of faith to understand uh, the, the mystery of regeneration and apostasy, right? You have this, this text where Simon is said to have believed in Jesus, believed the gospel, got baptized, and has joined himself to the Christians, right? It's like there's a, it seems like a genuine conversion has happened. He believed, he's baptized, he's joined himself to, the, to Philip, he's walking around with him, and then yet very quickly, when the apostles show up, a deep gall of bitterness is revealed with the tangle or conspiracy of, eagle, uh, of evil, Acts 8, 23. He's got this deep bitterness problem. He says he's believed. He, it says he, he believed, he was baptized, he's joined them, and then there's this deep, deep problem. And so the question that it raises is whether Simon was truly regenerated, was he truly saved, and was, was this a temporary falling away that he then returned to the faith? Did he repent? We're not told. He says, pray for me, which maybe indicates a desire to, to repent, but we're not told. We're not told the story. What, what happened? Was he truly regenerated, or did he only have a, a temporary superficial faith? I think just on the surface, again, this is sort of should be a, an encouragement that, um, that this is something um, that has happened in the church from the beginning. Sometimes maybe someone you've known close to you, maybe even a teacher, maybe even a leader, um, you know, is, 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 seems like they're on fire for God, they're, they're following God, they're teaching, they're preaching, they're sharing the gospel, and then, and then something weird happens and they go off the deep end. And you say, like, what happened? What happened? Well, that's hard. It's, it's, it's heartbreaking and really difficult. But at the very least, one of the things that it should be reassuring about this story is, well, sometimes that happens. Sometimes that happens, and it's been happening since the beginning, 
right? They have this guy, the leader, and then he, he's in a bad place. Ju- Jesus, of course, had Judas, one of the apostles, one of the disciples closest to Jesus. Paul had a man named Demas, 2 Timothy 4.10, someone who was really helpful to him and really helpful in the gospel, and then he turned on him, right? This happens. We're in good company sometimes if the church continues to deal with some who turn away. Remember, Jesus taught that his word would go forth like seed on different kinds of soil, right? Jesus taught this. He says, my word's going to go forth like seed on different kinds of soil. So we see examples of temporary, superficial faith in the seed that fell on stony ground, fell among the thorns. It springs up briefly, but it doesn't have roots. It withers, or it's choked, or it just doesn't produce any fruit, right? Jesus teaches something similarly in John 15, where he says that he is the vine and we are the branches, but those branches that don't produce fruit in him are cut out. Right? So those, those plants or branches that have no roots and have no fruit, they're pruned, they're cut out. And yet, Jesus also clearly teaches in John chapter 6 that all whom the Father has given to him, he will not lose a single one and will raise him up on the last day, John 6. Of all whom the Father has given him, he says, I will not lose a single one, and I will raise him up on the last day. So how do we parse this? How do you parse that? Uh, There's been a tendency of many either to downplay the word in the sacraments, downplay it, uh, since it sometimes seems empty. Sometimes it seems hypocritical. Sometimes it doesn't seem to mean what we say it means. And so they emphasize what we might call the invisibility of the true church in the invisibility of true faith. We just can't know. You just can't know. It's, all, it's, just, it's just all invisible. Only God knows. You just can't know. Or else, of course, there's another ditch, and the other ditch is overemphasizing uh, the importance and efficacy of the visible church, the visible ministry, professions of faith, the gospel ministry, and, and, and sacraments. And, but that can tend to make salvation something then that has to come and go, right? Well, they were in, uh, but now they're out. Now they're in, oh, now they're out. Now they're saved, oh, not saved anymore. Hey, you better get baptized again, better come forward again, better do the thing again, because you, obviously you lost it. And, and that creates uh, problems the other way. So there's two temptations, two temptations to uncertainty, two temptations to unbelief. One is, you just can't know. It's all invisible, it's all secret, you just can't know. Who's to say? Who knows? Or you can, you can get it and lose it, get it and lose it, get it and lose it, and again, there you are in uncertainty again. Who's to know? Ho- hopefully you die on a good day. Good luck. Right? Right? That, that's, that's what you end up with, uncertainty on either side. The Reformed tradition has taught to avoid both of these extremes by emphasizing the sovereignty of God and his goodness and grace and faith in his word. The Reformed tradition seeks to emphasize, avoid both those extremes by em- emphasizing the sovereignty of God and faith in his word. What do we mean by that? We mean that God is in control and he's not tricking us. God is in control and he's not tricking us. He's in control and he's not tricking us. Let God be true and every man a liar. What does this mean? Well, this translates into a high view of the word in the sacraments, a high view of the church, the word going forth, those who profess faith, those who are baptized, a high view of these things and efficacy of these things while simultaneously insisting that the spirit is still totally free and the hearts of men are wily. So this means that some, some come to hear hear the gospel, some come and enjoy the common operations of the spirit, but do not produce the actual fruit of the spirit. They don't have roots, so they don't have fruit. No root, no fruit. And so we see that in the scripture, and some of us have seen that in various ways in people's lives. But it also means that to those whom God gives root and fruit, he has begun a good work that he promises to complete. Philippians 1. He who began a good work in you will complete it. Philippians 1. Those whom the Father has given to the Son, he will not lose a single one. He will raise them up on the last day. While the Bible sometimes describes some as shipwrecking the faith, there's something they threw away. There's something that they threw away. Salvation is not really something you can lose since it was never something that you possessed. Salvation is not really something you can lose because it's not something that you possess. 
Salvation is being possessed by God. It's God grasping hold of you. Your assurance of salvation is not you holding on, right? As if God's the helicopter and you're on the bottom and <laughs> he's going to take you to heaven and good luck. Don't let go. No, 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 no. He got hold of you and he hauled you all the way into the helicopter and he's taking you home. Right? Right? And in the process, some people, all of us to some extent, struggle and kick. And it it's sometimes looks messy on this side. But everyone for whom Christ died, he gets. He doesn't try to get people. He's Lord. He doesn't try to save. He saves. Right? And, he, and we know that he, he did it already because he died for them and purchased them and rose from the dead for them. It's all done. It's all paid for. Right? They're going to come home because he bought them. He bought them with his own blood. None of his blood goes to waste. Right? Every, every drop of it paid for souls that will live with him forever. Everyone that he gives root and fruit to, he's going to bring home. So John Calvin described it like this. He says, all men have not that grace given them in baptism. Not all men have that grace given them in baptism. Which grace is there figured? Right? It really is figured. It really is promised. But not everyone receives it by faith. God really does give grace in the gospel. God really does give grace in the sacraments, but not all men receive it by faith in Christ. And so this underlines the sovereignty of God who must give the faith. He gives the faith. Faith is a gift so that no one can boast. But when he gives it, there can be no doubt. When he gives the gift of faith, there can be no doubt. So, you know, the, the question is, well, do, you say, well, did he give it to me? Well, do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? When you hear the gospel preached, when you hear Christ crucified for sinners, raised from the dead to win the nations, what happens? What do you think? Do you say, I love that? Well, then you have the gift of faith. Of course you do. You say, but I still sin. Right, but how do you feel about that? I don't like it. Good. <laughs> you, say, you say, I still struggle with sin. Right. Do you hate it? Yeah, I hate it with everything. You have the gift of faith. Only, only faith in the living God, only faith in the resurrected Jesus hates sin. Right? It's unbelief that says, I kind of like it. Actually, I think I'm going to sin more. I, I don't care about this religion stuff. I'm just here to make business connections, right, or whatever. That's, that's unbelief. That's hard-heartedness. You say, I love Jesus. I love singing the Psalms. I, I love that. I love being here at church. I love being around God's people. Well, then that's the gift of faith. You have the gift of faith, and everyone who God gives the gift of faith to, they're safe in the hand of Jesus, and he will raise them up. Right? That's, that's for certain, right? But you say, well... But what about those who seem to have all these things and then turn away? Like Simon, right? Calvin says this of Simon. He says, and although the receiving of, receiving of baptism did not profit him nothing then, he says it didn't do anything for him, he says, yet if conversion followed afterward, as some men suppose, then the profit was not extinguished nor abolished. Right? If he repented and if he came back, then it, then God did exactly what he promised to do, right? Many prodigals come home. That, there's a story about it, right? There's a story about it. Why? Because they come home. Because God brings them home. Because Christ gets his man. Right? If Christ has claimed them, then they can't get away, right? Christ leaves the 99 and he goes and gets the one. That's, that's the gospel, right? And so this story doesn't tell us what happened to Simon, it only closes with Simon asking the apostles to pray for him and the word continuing to go forth, right? The church tradition mostly didn't like him. They, we get the name simony for buying and selling uh, church offices in the Middle Ages, uh, priesthoods and monasteries and things like that, buying and selling those things from this guy, Simon, who offered the apostles money. But the Bible doesn't actually tell us what actually happened. It leaves us here. It leaves us here. This story is what God has given us. And so this is for our good. It's both a warning and a comfort, a deep comfort at that. The warning is to guard your own hearts and watch out for all bitterness and all tangles of evil in you. Right? Watch out for bitterness in you. We have no official system of simony in our modern evangelical churches. There's no buying or selling, openly at least, of pastorates and churches and buildings and this kind of thing. But there's plenty of buying and selling of favors and flattery popularity contests, and man-pleasing. 
If you, if you don't think the same sin's still in existence, you're not paying attention. This game can be played with hospitality, who has who over for dinner, who gets invited with whom, who are the in crowds, who are the out crowds. This can happen with friend groups. This can happen with educational methods. We're the homeschoolers, we're the low gossers, we're the white horse haulers, we're the CC, we're, we're the jubileers, whatever. Right? If you don't think that you can, this will happen, this can happen. This, get, this game can be played with different medical or dietary practices. Uh, we're, you know, we're the home birthers, we're the hospitalers, we're the, you know, all naturals, we're the gluten freers, we're the, you know, whatever. Like, you know, people take something and make a flag out of it, right? Right. And, and, and then, are you in? Are you in with us, right? You, you don't ever give your kids Twinkies, do you? Okay. All right, good. Um, or whatever. Uh, we only do Twinkies. Oh, good. Part, part of the only Twinkie club. We look for the with, for the breakfast cereals with the most sugar. We do too. Good. All right, good. Um, but here's the thing. Okay, all of this, all of this is a weird sort of way of trying to buy the Holy Spirit. What are you trying to buy? You're trying to buy peace. You're, pri- you're trying to buy joy. You're trying to buy meaning. You're trying to buy belonging. Who gives peace and joy and belonging? The Holy Spirit. You can't buy the Holy Spirit. You can't, right? And if you try, may your money perish with you, right? If you try, if you're trying to buy buy the peace of friendship, the joy of friendship, the belonging of friendship, you know, all these things, peace, communion, fellowship, you're trying to buy that by, you know, even people do this even with theology, holding all the right theological views, right? We we, we read all of Doug's books and we, we just check all of the boxes bought a bunch of books trying to get the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a bunch of truth there. There's a bunch of glory there. But what it's pointing you to is what? Christ and him crucified. Christ and him crucified and risen from the dead and the giver of the Holy Spirit freely. You can't buy it. You can't buy the Holy Spirit. No way, no how. This is where the poisonous root of bitterness fundamentally comes from, right? The sovereign spirit gives and rules as he pleases. The sovereign spirit gives and rules as he pleases. He gave you your wife, your husband, your kids, your parents, your job, your house, your kitchen, your income, your car. The Holy Spirit has given these gifts to you. And are you rejoicing in it or are you bitter? But I want that. I want that family. I want that house. I want that car. I want that income. I want that wife. I want that husband. I want that marriage. I want that table fellowship. No, no, no. What is the Holy Spirit given to you? Right? Right? What is the Holy Spirit given to you? Bitterness resents what the Holy Spirit has done. Contentment rests in the Father's gifts of his Spirit in all things. Right? Contentment rests. Right? Simon was bitter. He resented what the Spirit was doing. He resented the sovereignty of the Spirit. Don't resent the sovereignty of the Spirit. Don't resent what the Spirit has given you. Rest in the Father's gifts to you. Is he good? Yes, he is. Will will not he who gave his only son for you, not with him, also give us all things? Isn't he good? Can he be trusted? Does he know what he's doing with you and your family? Does Does he know what he's doing? Yes, he knows what he's doing then rest. Then rest in that. Do not be bitter about that. Do not be anxious about that. Do not be resentful about that. Rest in that. There's also great comfort here as well. The gospel came to the Samaritans. The gospel came to the Samaritans. While wicked men were plotting, while wicked men were throwing good people in jail, Christ was saving all kinds of Samaritans. While the nations rage and plot vain things, Christ is still saving sinners, those who are far off and those who are near, including the ones who once professed faith and have turned away in bitterness or apathy. We serve the God who raises the dead. We serve the God who raises the dead. We serve the God who saves sinners. Why does God allow this? You say, why does God allow this? Many of us can think of someone right now in our life who is in some kind of Simon moment, right? Can you think of somebody? 
right? Someone who you know, professed faith, someone who was baptized, someone who grew up in the church, and now they're not walking with God. They're not walking in the light. Many of us can think of someone without some kind of Simon moment. At one time, they seemed to be walking in the light, but now they aren't, or at least they aren't thriving. What should we think of this? Why, why is God allowed for this? Number one, God does all things for his glory. All things for his glory, which means we need to see, trust that, believe that. Why is God allowing this? For his own glory. For his own glory. Uh, I, it was just you know, again from the Lord, but I got, I got a text this week from someone who I pray for regularly. It's just out of the blue. I was like, thanks, Lord. <laughs> right? Someone who's, you know, I've prayed for regularly, and I don't hear from very much at all. And out of the blue, God says, <laughs> here you go. <laughs> right? For his own glory. Right? I, I was full of way more joy this week, rejoicing in that. Just a little token of God's kindness about someone who I pray for regularly. Right? Why did God do this? So that I'd rejoice in him more this week. Right? For his own glory. Right? He's doing it. He knows what he's doing. Worship him. Worship him there. Worship him where it's hard. Worship him where you're tempted to say, no, not here. Yeah, worship him there. Worship him there. Say, you are God, and you know what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for even this. Worship him there. Thank him for it. Praise him for it. But he does this also so that we'll pray more. He does this so we'll pray. We'll pray for them. We'll pray more faithfully. He does this so the word will go forth, so that we will love more thoughtfully, more faithfully, so the gospel will multiply. Right? So that we'll have to share the gospel more. We'll have to pray more. We'll have to remind them of the gospel more. And ultimately, so that our joy will be even greater when he saves. Father, we ask you to give us faith this morning that rests in your fatherly goodness and therefore trusts you for the salvation of the most hardened unbelievers in our lives. Father, we ask you to give us that faith for those who have turned away from you. Father, particularly for those who made some profession of faith, who were baptized, who showed some fruit, we ask you to remember your promises and please bring them home. Father, help us not to lose hope. Help us to be faithful while we wait. And we ask for this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, singing. One of the central realities on display in this meal is our covenantal union with Christ. Now, much can be said about the theological implications of this union, but practically, what our union with Christ means for us is that the favor that God the Father has for His Son is the same favor that now rests upon us. Indeed, our union with Christ means that the words that the Father declared over Christ in His baptism are now the same words that He declares over each one of us. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Consider for a moment, is it possible for the Father's favor for his Son to fail? Is it possible that God the Father might not work all things for the good of his Son, whom he has granted eternal dominion and glory? Of course not. The Father delights in his Son with an eternal delight, and he desires to give him all things as his inheritance. If you are in Christ, this same favor, this pleasure that the Father takes in his own Son now rests upon you and is on display for you in this meal despite the week you just had, despite your anxiety about that business deal, despite the fact that you got angry at your kids, despite your argument with your spouse, or that you gave in to temptation yet again. You've already confessed your sins. You've asked for the Lord's mercy, and you've received his forgiveness. What remains for you now is to look on him in faith, trusting that his favor now rests upon you, that he is both with and for you, and that he most certainly will work all things for your good. Why? Because he will not fail his own son to whom you've been united. So look to him now and receive his grace and come and welcome to Jesus Christ. On the night Before I give the charge and benediction, I've been asked to um, ask you if you have a gently used bulletin. It seems we've run a little short for second service. So you just drop those on the table at the back um, that, so the second service folks can use those. That would be great. The charge to you this morning is to trust in your God. Trust in him. 
Trust in him, where, particularly for those places where you think, I don't know if the gospel can get in there. I don't know if the gospel can bring him back. No, look at this text. See what Christ did. He sent his spirit so that the gospel would go and conquer the world. It's gotten all the way here. It's gotten all the way to you. There is no place where that gospel cannot go. Christ has conquered all. So trust him and go now with his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his counts upon you and grant you his peace. Amen.